Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is our first show of the week, Think Tech Hawaii. And we're going to do Think Tech Asia now. We're going to talk about Asia with a very honored guest, and that is Admiral Thomas Fargo, a retired Pacific commander, which is a very big job. <laughs> Admiral Fargo, so nice to have you here. Great to be with you again, Jay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so you had plenty of experience in dealing with Asia in your role as Pacific commander and, and since uh, with all the things you do. And uh, I would like to talk to you today about Korea, North Korea. This is a big thing, and it... It is a big event that affects the United States' position in Asia Pacific, don't you think? Well, absolutely, and you know, of course, we've been uh, we've been working the North Korea issues for uh, for decades, really, uh, throughout my my whole time, and, um, and and of course, over the last couple of weeks, uh, uh, there have been some dramatic uh, happenings. I mean, if you looked a couple months ago, we were. Uh, watching missiles uh, fly over the top of Japan and nuclear detonations in North Korea. And now we've had some uh, startling pronouncements. Yeah, I'll say. I mean, a complete reversal just a few days ago was like headline news from a, a, a point of view of arguments and name calling and, and, and threaten, threatening and, and, and unfortunately false alarms here about nuclear missiles. That'll get your, your blood boiling. Um, now we have uh, Kim Jong-un saying, no, I'm going to hold up on that. I've already achieved my goal. I really wonder about that statement. Uh, I've already achieved my goal, so I'm not going to do any more of that. You should be happy. So, query, is he telling the truth when he says he's already achieved his goal? Well, it, it's hard to tell um, uh, because in, in large measure, uh, you know, we don't believe that he has accomplished all that we would expect in terms of the, the testing regime. You know, the kinds of things that would give you the confidence that you could uh, actually have an operational uh, nuclear weapon that you could, you know, move uh, uh, to the United States. So, uh, so we don't know the answer to that. Uh, but he, he may have achieved the, um, maybe what he believes are the domestic political uh, efforts that he has to accomplish to move forward. And, you know, time will tell, but we don't have clarity in that issue right now. <clears throat> and do you believe him when he says he's really stopped whatever he was doing? Well, I I think uh, I think uh, it, from external appearances uh, certainly he, he will. I mean, I I do think he wants this uh, summit uh, very much. Uh, he appears to be trying to set the stage uh, to ensure that it it actually happens because, as you know, there have been statements that are made that uh, uh, we're not going to go into these discussions unless. Uh, certain preconditions uh, are clearly met. Uh, so yeah, I think from an external standpoint, uh, he thinks that uh, he is going to meet those requirements, but you know, we don't have anybody in country, we don't have an inspection regime, it's really hard to know. Yeah, well, we can, we have the technology to tell when he's uh, doing a nuclear test, right? Sure. There's a seismic reading yeah, and all if that. He, if he makes a detonation, we'll, we'll know it, and we can, uh, in many respects, measure the size and uh, and the, the nature of that uh, detonation, sure. And the same thing with uh, with testing a ballistic missile. Uh, we can see it coming. I, mean, I assume we're out there somehow with whatever uh, technology we have, watching everything. We certainly have the ability to monitor ballistic missile testing and, and also anything that occurs that would release uh, uh, into the atmosphere the, the kinds of indicators that a nuclear weapon, weapon has been detonated. Yeah. Gee, there's so many issues here. And, and his change of heart, um, what, you know, uh, that's a remarkable change of heart from name calling to, okay, okay, uh, I'll do it your way. Um, what, do you have any idea, any even speculation about why he changed on a dime that way? Well, it, you know, it's hard to tell. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I think he, he wants this uh, particular summit, he wants these negotiations. Uh, but uh, what the end state is, uh, and what his uh, believed end state is, is really hard to tell. You know, if you look at all the experts that have been talking over the last 
a couple of weeks, they, they fall into kind of three camps, okay. uh, in, <laughs> in my view. The, the first camp is the, the most optimistic one, is that uh, uh, Kim has act, actually decided that now is the time to exchange his nuclear weapons program for uh, the kind of economic stimulus that the world can provide. In other words, uh, uh, he's going to forego this investment, which is considerable, and of course, uh, there's limited investment in that North Korea can make and uh, limit that investment in the nuclear program and, and look to invest in the economy and its people with uh, an awful lot of help from uh, the United States, China, uh, the other uh, key people that have a, a clear stake in this. And, and of course, the other thing that's on the table is uh, we don't have a peace treaty yet, right, with, uh, with North Korea. So uh, that's the optimistic uh, point a view that would say, and maybe there is a, uh, a universal solution here where he gives up his nuclear program completely, uh, we end up with uh, uh, providing uh, economic support for him, and eventually we come to some agreement on a number of different issues on the Korean Peninsula. Of course, the armistice, which is at the top of that list. Yeah. In, the, in the middle is what I would call the uh, what he's really looking for is some sort of an arms control agreement where he would limit his nuclear program, uh, there would be an inspection regime, uh, he, would, uh, he would make various promises uh, that we would have to be able to ascertain are, are, are valid, and we'd have to accept you know, something less than the total denuclearization of the Korean uh, Peninsula. So there are, are folks that think there, there might be a position there. He might believe there's a position. As a matter of fact, uh, my guess is that that's probably uh, where he would like to see uh, the outcome. And then on the other extreme uh, is uh, the view that, hey, we've been down this road again. Uh, this is just the next iteration of kind of the bait and switch. And we're going to go to the table. And when we really get down to uh, brass tacks, uh, he doesn't want to give up this program, and this will be a futile effort. So you, you have concern about that? Well, you have to have concern about it. I mean, history is history is on the side of that argument, <laughs> of course, and uh, hopefully that's not the way this will will end up. Uh, but certainly, uh, if you looked at the cycle we've been on over the last uh, twenty years, uh, it leads you in that direction. Well, reviewing the events over the past couple of weeks, um, we should look and see how, how various events we've read in the paper, um, you know, affect this. I mean, for example, um, uh, the uh, director of the CIA goes out and plays a, a, apparently a diplomatic role, and that had to have some effect because it happened in proximate time. Uh, what was that all about? Do you have a sense of that? Did that catch you by surprise? You did, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, me, me too. Uh, but it, I do think it's an indication that there is some seriousness here, you know, that, uh, uh, that maybe uh, there's the potential to, uh, to ease the, the current very serious uh, situation on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so I think it caught everybody by surprise. Of course, uh, they managed to pull it off without um, it being tipped in advance, which is tough to do in the, in the current day and age. Uh, so, you know, I would have to think that's a, a positive uh, event. Yeah. And it had to be, it had to be done with the um, subsequent move of appointing Pompeo as Secretary of State. It had to be done with that in mind, don't you think? You know, I, I don't, uh, I think Pompeo was uh, the logical guy to go as the director of the CIA. If you look back into other events of, of this nature over time, uh, you know, the intelligence, uh, not agreements, but relationships and access and back channels that we have, uh, I think allow the director of the CIA or other folks in, in that community uh, an opportunity to do that. So. I, so I can't tie it directly to the Secretary, mm. Secretary of State. I think it's more closely tied to his current role. Ah, interesting. Another thing that happened, uh, of course, is, um, is that the, uh, the propaganda loudspeakers at the 38th parallel, parallel, which have been operated by South Korea for mm, how many years, were turned off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> for the first time. I've heard those speakers, by the way, <laughs> up close and personal, yeah. They were, what are they? They're just running North Korea down and, and, and um, uh, talking about the wonderful life in South Korea, asking people to desert, that sort of thing. Sure. I, but I think you're seeing a, a lot of um, what might be considered uh, relatively minor, uh, but uh, signaling initiatives of, of that nature that, uh, you know, are happening kind of a, across the spectrum, you know, with the certainly the, the South Koreans and the, and the uh, meetings that are being keyed up for their leadership, uh, even discussions out of Japan about meetings. Yeah. Well, we should take a look at your, uh, your map, your chart, and sort of get a geographical uh, view of this. So uh, we have this chart, and it, it shows uh, the various countries, among other things, it shows the various countries around North Korea. And I wonder if we could tick off the involvement or lack of involvement of each one of them. I mean, for example, you mentioned uh, you know, what we know South Korea is important in this, and uh, certainly uh, Japan is important in this, and China is a big question. Sure. Um, I really like this slide, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in, uh, in a few minutes because it, it relates to China's uh, strategy. But if you look at the right-hand side of the map, and, and you can see the Korean Peninsula and Japan, and of course, uh, uh, China to the uh, w to the west and north um, of Korea. Uh, China, obviously, a big player and and very important to these discussions. Uh, you saw the visit that Kim Jong Un made to uh, uh, to With China. That old railway train he's got. That old railroad it's really cute. train. It's been used before <laughs> for those uh, for those purposes. But his first time. Uh, out of the country, and and once again, I think one of those events on the uh, on the periphery of all this that is significant in terms of how you stage these potential talks and and those communications, and you know, obviously, uh, citizens like you and I don't know what was discussed uh, in those conversations, but hopefully, but hopefully others do. So uh, China is a huge player. They've got great equities. They've got great equities over the long term uh, with respect to the Korean Peninsula. Obviously, they have a significant border, uh, you know, on the north. And certainly, uh, any kind of resolution of, of the armistice, uh, of the relationship between the north and the south, and with the United States, uh, China is, is uh, more than just hugely interested. Yeah, I mean, reunification would be a big problem for China, wouldn't it? Well, it, it, it could be. I mean, that, uh, that puts uh, the armistice kind of on, not the armistice, excuse me, our alliance with the South kind of on their border, and, and that's probably an uncomfortable position for, for China. So, uh, so that's, that's a factor, and uh, any long-term solution, they would certainly you know, want to be a robust player. Uh, with respect to uh, South Korea, I think their equities are are very clear. Um, they have they've taken the lead uh, on this particular uh, set of uh, of talks, and uh, and they have, as you can imagine, with uh, North Korea on their border and chemical weapons that can range uh, Seoul, uh, they've got uh, huge equities uh, for their future. And and even if it it was an amicable uh, re. Uh, Unification of of some nature, you can imagine the economic aspects of that uh, because they're uh, they'd be dramatic. Uh, Japan, uh, Japan has uh, uh, a huge uh, equity in all this. Obviously, North Korea can range them. They've had issues with uh, the North over over decades. Uh, uh, you're well aware of of all of them from people being actually taken hostage in Japan and brought back to the north to uh, uh, the threat from the North Koreans to, uh, to a, a long uh, history. Uh, so that's uh, a big player. And then the Russians, obviously, uh, they've got a border also. Uh, they're concerned they were original member of the six-party talks uh, during the last uh, significant effort to you know, resolve these difficulties, and, uh, and they uh, they believe that uh, they ought to be involved in some extent also. It's so interesting that you spoke about this uh, in, in the Scheidler um, 
uh, PAMI program, yeah. and Paul Chun uh, uh, annual lecture, <coughs> what, about 90 days ago, something sure. like that. And uh, we didn't realize how much would happen in that 90 days. No, as, as, uh, as usual, when you talk about North Korea, uh, you're going to find out, you know, three weeks later, you're precisely wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not precisely wrong, but uh, there's obviously uh, new elements uh, that, you know, really dramatic this time. Well, I think the big one, we should, we should um, you know, look at all this as sort of a, as an assemblage of nations in the Asia Pacific, but the big one, of course, is us. And right after this break, Admiral Fargo, I'd like to cover that with you. We'll be right back. Look forward to it. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of A Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for A Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live with Admiral Thomas Fargo, the uh, retired former commander of Pacific, uh, in the, in the, well, all of the services in the Pacific. It was quite a job. Did you sleep well during that time? Yeah, actually, I, I slept pretty, pretty well for <laughs> most of it, uh, you know, largely because uh, we have such a, a tremendous uh, capability in terms of our people and, uh, and uh, the, the quality of our, our military, both forward and and throughout the Pacific AOR. So I, you know, I actually, uh, it wasn't that there weren't things that we worried about, uh, but we could sleep. And you and I got to know each other in, in the, um, in, in the con in connection with the Amy Maru in 2001. We were on different sides of the fence. I was with the press, and <laughs> you were, you were uh, the, uh, the, I, I want to say SYNCPAC. I always want to say SYNCPAC. But the, um, the commander, uh, the convening authority in, in the case yeah. of Scott Waddle. Yeah, I was the commander of the Pacific Fleet then, and I, I was a convening authority, and and we did uh, we did talk a lot, kind of a, across the the table. You yeah. were <laughs> asking the questions, and and I was answering the questions, and uh, we were fortunate that uh, the Court of Inquiry uh, laid out uh, all there was to possibly know yeah. about that that tragedy, and uh, we were able to. Uh, one, uh, you know, hold the right folks accountable. Uh, two, uh, you know, deal with, uh, you know, the significant cultural concerns of the, of the Japanese. Uh, and as you know, we actually salvaged that, uh, that ship and recovered the remains. And, and, uh, and certainly, uh, even today, that's a, it's a big part of, uh, of Hawaii. And, uh, and I think about it, uh, you know, on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. It was an extraordinary time, I remember. No, it was probably the most, most difficult single um, issue I had to resolve in, in my military career. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was resolved well, uh, I thought. And, um, and I'm happy it came out the way it came out. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, so um, back, to, um, back to Hawaii and the United States and how all of this in Korea plays for them. Uh, as you mentioned during the break, Hawaii is a, is, is a center of the Pacific in, in so many ways. So we are unique in, in the, may I say, equities that we have in this whole issue. Yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, Hawaii is uh, strategic in nature. I mean, this is the center of gravity of our Pacific forces. You know, not only Admiral Harris is headquartered here, but all of the component commanders from the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and, uh, and the Marines. Uh, so, obviously, any conflict uh, in uh, Asia and the Pacific, even actually Indo-Asia and the Pacific, uh, uh, you know, would essentially be coordinated from, uh, from Hawaii. Uh, the second piece is that, you know, Hawaii connects to Asia, and I think everybody understands this. Uh, 
you know, culturally, it, it certainly does. Uh, you know, the diversity of our, of our population here, uh, many folks that live here, you know, have their roots in, in Asia, and, and not just Japan, you know, Korea, the Philippines, uh, all of, uh, of East and, and Southeast Asia. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, there's, uh, there is a potential threat to Hawaii. That, uh, that threat is, uh, I don't think, tremendously more significant now than uh, it is for the West Coast of the United States, since the Korean missiles, as we know, in the most recent tests, the North Korean missiles can range the, the West Coast of the United States. But, uh, but at some point, we need to think about it. And uh, as you know, uh, Admiral, Admiral Davidson just uh, testified in his confirmation hearing last week, and, and we talked about what we need to do to make sure that we can defend Hawaii robustly uh, moving forward. Yeah, that would, be, uh, that would be of concern because we're so far away from anywhere else and because a nuclear attack on Hawaii would have a devastating effect, I, I think, um, if not for, from the immediate blast and from the, the fallout later. Yeah, yeah I, I don't want to make it sound like that's probable. That is still a very tough task to send yeah. uh, for the Koreans to gain the capability to send a nuclear weapon that could actually hit Hawaii. I mean, that's in the, in the very small percentiles. Yeah. So. Well, this all, you know, reminds me of the mouse that roared with Peter Sellers about mm -hmm. some unknown country in the South. I'm old enough to remember that. <laughs> I, can, I can talk to that. <laughs> and, you know, at the end of the day, there was an article in the Times this morning or yesterday um, to, for the proposition that maybe the president gave up too much. Uh, it's not clear what he gave up, though. It's the problem. Now, some people think, well, just, just meeting with Kim Jong-un is giving up too much. Um, on the other hand, there must be other things in play here. And if you, if you gauge it from the remarks made by Kim Jong-un, these are, as you said, these are economic things. This could be the mouse that roared. They make all this noise with the specific intention of, of uh, you know, inviting investment, of inviting trade, of becoming a, a responsible, more responsible member of the Asia-Pacific community, and getting wealthy in the process. Uh, it could be, I mean, I, in, my, in my heart, I believe that's, that's his motivation. Um, and, the, and really the question is, um, well, what's in your heart? Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, that may be precisely his motivation, but that's not going to be given away, you know, without uh, uh, very, very significant uh, concessions on his part that uh, are, you know, tantamount to essentially uh, neutering his nuclear capability. Uh, it's just, as you point out, Trump hasn't given anything away yet. and. And, and I think this is an opportunity you can't miss. I mean, I know there are folks that say this is a waste of time. Uh, we don't know that. And, and frankly, uh, nothing else has worked, right? And this is an opportunity that I think uh, is a, a, responsible, uh, is a responsible effort. I don't, I don't know where it's going to end up. It, it could end up like all the rest of them in the dustbin, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it would be a mistake to pass it up. What's the role of the military? I mean, if you can see it from where we are, the role of the military in, in, in developing this uh, initiative, in, in organizing this meeting, or uh, the, the moves that are being made? Well, I, I don't think uh, the, the role has really changed. Uh, I mean, we need to have a, uh, a strong, resilient uh, capability to, uh, to back up the, uh, the political and diplomatic efforts that are that are made by our government, and and we do, and that that comes in a lot of different forms. Missile defense is probably one that that I'd put at uh, at the very top of the list, uh, but also our ability to uh, help defend South Korea, and you know we've been doing that for uh, decades, right, sixty some odd odd years, and and that's important because uh, I think I think what everybody needs to understand. Not only the North Koreans, uh, but everybody in Asia is the the quality of our capability, as well as the quality of our relationships with the rest of these countries uh, in Asia. Yeah, it's all about hege hege hegemony, um, and you know the United States has had tremendous influence in Asia and Asia Pacific since the war. Um, and it's remarkable how much we have been able to do with a, a mostly soft power and smart power rather than hard power. 
Um, and, uh, you know, a fellow um, by the name of Simon Winchester out of the East West Center wrote a book. Yeah. And in one of the chapters of that book, he talked about, you know, the relative decline, if you will, of the influence of the United States in Asia. I mean, and you can measure that, if you like, with the fact that uh, China has taken over the um, uh, China, South China Seas. Um, and and we, we, his point was we have to get used to it. We have to get used to being more of an equal partner than a, than a commanding partner uh, in, the, in the power structure of, of Asia Pacific. So I guess I, I would, I'm interested in your thoughts about that and, and how the North Korea scenario as it plays out affects our hegemony, hegemony excuse me, uh, in Asia Pacific. Yeah, I wouldn't call it hegemony, uh, but I, I do think what you said at the very start is an important point. Uh, essentially, the economic prosperity of Asia that has developed over the past uh, 30 to 40 years is a direct result of the stability that the United States military ensured, you know, throughout Asia. And, and we did so in a manner that didn't threaten anybody's sovereignty, uh, but we, uh, we did, and even, even China, you know, uh, talks to this, we did provide uh, that you know, the relative uh, peace and stability that is always necessary for economic prosperity. And uh, Japan prospered, South Korea prospered, and China has prospered as a, it's been a great run. as a result of that. And it's been really good. And I think if you look at the current situation, uh, because of that, nobody's anxious to see the United States uh, leave the Indo-Asia area. I mean, that stability that we provided uh, remains important. Uh, and I would uh, disagree a little bit on the South China Sea. I mean, I, it's, it's very clear that uh, China's effort to uh, build these uh, suburb features in some case into, into military bases. And when you look at them and you see the actual models of them, it's hard to recognize them as anything else other than uh, certainly a potential military base. 10,000 foot runways, ports that could take an aircraft carrier, they're very, they're very significant. But uh, in that same period of time, uh, I mean, right now, uh, we, haven't, we haven't left either, and we're not about to create a vacuum there, and we're not about to, uh, uh, to leave our, uh, our allies and our friends uh, in an uncomfortable position there. I mean, we're going to remain present. Uh, our capabilities will do nothing but improve. You know, once again, we're not, we're not looking for, for bases. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking to be uh, a good friend, an ally, and maintain the appropriate presence in the region. Yeah, that's really important for us, I think, uh, for all of us. Uh, <clears throat> China is a wonderment here. Uh, you know, China we always see as the, the one who supported North Korea in the war back when, in the, in the 50s. Um, and China, you know, has an ongoing trade relationship of some substance with North Korea and has supported it and maybe, you know, used it as a buffer, but it's also useful for China to, to, to have that relationship. Um, so the train comes with Kim Jong-un, and they have a meeting, and I, you know, I'm, I'm with you, I'm very curious to know what happened. I hope we find out what happened at that meeting. But if you wonder about it, you think, well, the two of them are in league in some way. They're fashioning some kind of plan together. And then we find, most recently, um, an article, again, in the Times, that suggested that uh, China may be losing control of the situation. <laughs> that China, China may not be as strong in this, in this whole scenario yeah. as it was, or we thought it was. Where is China in this situation? But, you know, China has always argued that, um, that they don't have as much influence uh, over North Korea as we, uh, as we contend. And, but you know, they clearly have their hand on the oil valve, right? And, and they have their hand on the on all the trade uh, across that border. And, uh, you know, I, I do believe that China has stepped up uh, in large measure to, to help with uh, the kind of pressure the Trump administration has put on North Korea. And my personal view is the, the best of the sanctions have always been the financial sanctions where, uh, when you can, where you can cut off um, foreign currency reserves and take that away from him, then it's very difficult for him to uh, maintain uh, the same standard of life yeah. for the elites in, in North Korea. So just, just as the best sanctions are economic, so are the best incentives are sure, economic. Sure, and, 
and and that's kind of the direction this thing this thing is headed. Uh, but I I do think that uh, that China can play uh, a constructive role here. I think uh, I think North Korea has been a pain to them in a, in a lot of respects, and uh, China is not anxious for North Korea to have a, a nuclear capability that that leads to lots of things, including you know, our buildup of missile defense capabilities in sure. South Korea and things like that. So, so the, the, the China-North Korea relationship is not all hugs and kisses by any imagination. And uh, th there's friction there, too. But uh, they're going to be a relevant player. Assume for a minute, my last question, and I, and I apologize, it's a political question. Um, um, if, if, if the president succeeds in this, I mean, arguably succeeds, even close succeeds, this is going to be a huge political impact, don't you think? This is going to affect the midterms. It's going to affect his reelectability at the end of his term, don't you think? Well, you know, it, when you look at it uh, over the time you and I have been talking about this, Jay, this has been the most difficult problem uh, the, uh, that we've dealt with. I mean, we've, we've tried time and time again different approaches and have been unable to resolve it. Uh, and once again, the uh, uh, the war, uh, you know, the war, the Korean War from the 50s hasn't been uh, resolved yet. So it's been intractable. And, and if, if this administration could pull that off, uh, it would be hugely uh, significant, momentous, really. And, and of course, uh, in, in a lot of respects, it, it'll have uh, huge impacts on, on Asia moving forward. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you. Admiral Always Fargo, pleasure, Thomas Jay. Fargo, we know each other since 2001. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.